Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Good to see you this morning. Amen. On this great cold day, at least cold for down south. Amen. Well, there was an Amish family who had never, ever been to the city. They had never been off the Amish farm. So they decided, you know what? It's about time that we headed into the big city. And of all places they went, they went for the very first time to the city mall. And so all four of them went there in the family and they got there in the mall and what they decided to do was the Amish dad and his son went off one way and the Amish mom and her daughter went off another direction to shop or to look at things in the mall. Well, the Amish dad and his son came across this silver, shiny, two-door sliding machine that had numbers up on top. They'd never seen an elevator before. Matter of fact, the boy asked his dad, he said, Dad, what is that? And he said, son, I've never seen anything like that in my whole life. I don't know what that is. This hunched over old woman barely made it into the elevator and the door closed. The numbers went one, two, three, four, five, and then they went five, four, three, two, one, and this real young blonde bombshell walked out of the elevator, and the Amish dad said, Son, quick, go get your mom. <laughs> now, if change could happen that quick, we'd be in good shape. But change doesn't happen that quick in any of us, amen? It just takes time for us to become like Christ. It's over the years. Now, that doesn't excuse us for not getting on board and being all we can be, but we need to be all God's calls us to be as quick as possible before we get to glory. Well, let's look at a passage this morning. This will be our passage in Jeremiah. Our text is Jeremiah 18, 1 through 4. And then the word came, which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will announce my words to you. And then I went down to the potter's house and there he was, making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hands of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. Well, this morning we're going to look at what life looks like on the potter's wheel. Because we're all on the potter's wheel if we're saved. That's where our life is all the time, because God's always in the process of shaping us and remaking us and shaping us in various ways, so... We need to look at how life is there. So if we're a Christian and we're always on that wheel, we ought to know how that life looks because it's described to us in Jeremiah 18, 1 through 4. Now, in context, I will agree that that passage is written to the nation of Judah, but it can, its application can be to our lives individually and what that looks like individually. So we'll look at that in the four, five lessons I believe Jeremiah learned that day the five lessons we should learn today as we leave out of this place of what the Lord wants to say to us. Number one is God still speaks to us. He hasn't stopped that. He's still doing that today as he did in Jeremiah. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, the Lord was saying, arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will announce my words to you. So two, two words right there have to do with speaking, saying and announcing. Those are both speaking words, are they not? And God still speaks. You say, I don't hear him. He still speaks. It's immaterial if we hear him or not. I mean, we should be, but God's still speaking. And he spoke here, and Jeremiah got to see him speak clearly. Now, he's going to go down to a potter's house so that he can get the word. He heard the word from the Lord, but he's going to get the rest of the word at a particular location, and that location is the potter's house. You know, there's 30 terms in the Hebrew that relates to pottery, pottery manufacturing, potters, all of those types of... 30 words, that's a lot of words in, a, in one particular occupation because the Bible's full of this one occupation, the pottery profession. Because it was very important, that's where a lot of people got or where everybody got their bowls and plates and cups and all that. That was the manufacturing system back then. So it was quite common to have this particular verbiage uh, in his vernacular. 
And he wants to say something to Jeremiah and he wants to say something to the nation of Judah and they need to be listening. Eight times in Revelation is this phrase, he who has an ear, let him hear. He who has an ear, let him hear. That goes on for eight times. Now, the Lord didn't mean for us to go in our bathroom, look in the mirror and say, yep, I got one of them. He who has an ear, I got one. Matter of fact, I got two. That's not what his intent was to say, do you have an ear? All of us have an ear, we got two. Have an ear, but do you hear? You know, you've talked with your children maybe or to a coworker or a friend, and you say, I don't think they heard what I said. Or you told an employee to do something, they didn't do what you said. They heard, but they didn't hear. They got your words, but they didn't take them into heart. And here, God wants to not only speak to us today, every day, but for us to hear what he says. The issue is, I believe, if he's speaking all the time, then the question is, why don't we hear what he says? Well, the question remains is, are we tuned in to what he's saying? I miss Frank Dvork in many different ways. We had some great fellowship before he went to be with the Lord and great conversations and Wednesday we'd spend in the office talking. But he was the only person I knew in the church like me that had just free TV that you had to have an antenna to pick it up. Not cable, not satellite, just an antenna and get what you could get for free. So Frank and I could talk about the challenges to that and all that kind of thing and nobody else I could talk to about that but him and he with me. And that means on top of my roof I have, yes, many children may not know what it is, it's an old TV that you get from Radio Shack. And that antenna on top of my house is able to pick up the individual invisible waves that go throughout the air. And it's able to pick up those invisible waves, hit my antenna, go down my wire, convert it, and come into my TV where I can watch TV for free. And during a windstorm, one of these hurricane deals, my antenna got all out of whack and I couldn't get anything. And me being afraid of heights, I go by the verse where the Lord said, Lo, I am with you always. And um, <laughs> it'll catch on in a minute. <laughs> so I try to not go too high because of that verse. But anyway, I'm up on the roof where I don't want to be with my cell phone in my hand, so that's one hand that I really need to hang on. And I'm calling downstairs inside the living room so I can get my antenna readjusted where I can pick up on these free airways again. And so I'm, now I could have done this, I could have stayed down in my comfortable room and called all of the stations and said, excuse me, could y'all all relocate your antennas? Because my antenna up there is not picking up signal. If y'all would all move your locations about maybe 100 miles to the left, then it would probably pick up on my antenna. Would you do that, please? No, they wouldn't do that. And God's not going to change his direction he's sending his word. I've got to readjust my antenna of my life to his way to pick up his airways or his words so I can hear them. See, it wasn't the TV station's fault that I didn't hear their signal. Their signal was still a firing, but Tim Strickland wasn't getting any of the signal. And they weren't going to move theirs. I had to move mine. I don't hear God. God doesn't speak to me. God's not leading me. Well, it isn't God's fault. His airways are still going across. You just got to have a pick-me-up signal that's pointed the right direction, which is called your life. Well, he just spoke to Jeremiah. He stopped doing that, you know, Brother Tim. Oh, really? He's the same yesterday, today, forever? Huh. He just stopped that, huh? He doesn't communicate with his children? Absolutely he communicates as long as we got our antenna focused. And how do we tune that in? Well, there's several ways you get tuned in. It's through his word. That's an antenna source. You want to find out what he says? He's speaking all through these pages. You want to hear what he says about your situation? Look at the book. And everything after this is still goes back to number one. 
If nothing lines up with number one, it isn't him speaking. <laughs> Did you catch that? If you're doing what's not in here, it's not him speaking. Well, Brother Tim, I think I need to do this. Well, that's the Word of God says opposite that. You had not heard from God. Because <laughs> God only speaks through his Word and through other places, but it always lines up with his Word. Then there's through his Spirit. You know, the Spirit lives within us, the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit will speak to us. We'll say, man, that's not right. And that is right. Of course, that'll always line up with the Word of God. But His Spirit is a tuner of what He's speaking. Then there's prayer. It's not only us speaking to God, but God speaking back to us in prayer as we communicate with Him. He talks that way. He talks through other believers. You say, another believer told me something that is against the Word of God. Then that's not God. Because His Word trumps everything else. It's above everything else. It's not... God speaking, but other believers can confirm things that maybe God's already spoken to you through your spirit. It's another confirmation. And of course, circumstances don't dictate as well. That happened, so this must be God. No, it lines up with everything else. That's just one more confirmation that you're hearing from God because all those other things are lining up with the same thing. Is God still speaking today? Yeah, just tune in. Get your antenna focused on those five things and they'll all line up what God's speaking to each of us. So, what lesson we have to learn is that God still speaks. Jeremiah found out that personally. Number two is, God still makes us. Seriously, makes, not make. God still makes us. And then I went down to the potter's house and there he was, making something on the wheel. He was making something. Why? Because God's always making something. That's us. You say, well, is that us? Well, it always confirms. Isaiah said it this way. We are the clay, and thou art thou our potter, and all of us are the work of thy hand. We're clay. You're the potter. You make stuff. You're making us. And that's what he's doing. He's making, he's shaping, he's forming, he's making us into Christ. Those of that, us that know Christ as our Savior, that's what he's in the business of doing. So you say, well, how does he make us? I'm glad you asked that question. Because there's several ways that he makes us. First of all, he starts with the cleaning time. That's positionally and practically. Psalm says, he brought me out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay. we got three people that believe that. We're all out of the pit. Some came from an alcohol pit. Some came from a drug pit. Came from an addiction pit. Some came from a, I was in church every Sunday thinking that would do it pit. Some said I try to do every good work to be saved pit. Some say it came from a, I was a goody two shoes pit. There's all kind of pits, but we're all came from the pit. And the more you believe and I believe we came from the pits, the more appreciative we will be for all that God does for us. He got, he got a good pick when he got me. Well, you're not going to be very happy in Christ if you feel that way. You're thinking, man, he picked me out of the pits. You know, I got it all. He got nothing. See, he got us out of that old miry clay. That was salvation. And then in that instant, we were 100% clean positionally because that's the only way we make it to heaven. If you had to positionally clean yourself up, then what if you died that next day after you got saved? You wouldn't have got time to clean yourself up and you wouldn't have went to heaven. You're 100% clean positionally so that you could die at that moment, stand in the presence of God and be 100% perfection. However, being that we're who we are, from the time we get saved to the time we go to glory, practically now we need to clean, get cleaned up. Let him clean us up to make us more like Jesus because there's a lot in us that doesn't look like Jesus. Wasn't it Bill Stafford that said, a sculpture's a pretty easy job. If you're going to sculpture a horse, all you got to do is take a block of granite and chip off everything that doesn't look like a horse. <laughs> pretty simple, isn't it? Just chip off everything that doesn't look like a horse. And there you got a horse. All that the Lord wants us to do now is to chip off everything in Tim Strickland that doesn't look like Jesus. 
And there's plenty to chip. Got to chip and chip and chip. And that's what the Lord's doing in us. He got to clean us. He gets us out of the miry pit for salvation. Now it's time to work on those other things that are practically need to be done. See, we are out of dirt, weren't we? Isn't that where we came from? If you've been with us on the Genesis series, Adam was made out of dirt. God took the dirt to the ground and made him. That's why the Bible says dust to dust. We came from dust, we'll go back to dust. I'm not saying anything wrong against this body. God made a, a great body out of dirt. I mean, look what he did with just a handful of dirt. He made a human body. That's amazing with the material he used. You see, because the ingredients that are in the earth are in our body. Proof that we came from the dirt. You don't believe that? Look at your vitamin box when you get home. Iron, zinc. Some of you take magnesium. Well, you're trying to make your dirt better. That's all you're doing. I got to improve this dirt. I got to take all these dirt supplements that are found in the ground. So my dirt will be healthier. A lot of you, hopefully most of you, showered your dirt this morning, combed your dirt, brushed your dirt, Steve, and made his dirt as best you could for church. But it's still going back to dirt. It's nothing against his creation, but it's our soul that matters. And God took us out of the clay and wants to make something of us. Once we've been saved, now it's time for the cleaning and the making us more like Christ. It was Paul who said in Romans 7, 18, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. In my flesh, there isn't anything good. The only thing good in me is going to be Jesus. Because even at my best, some of my stuff that I do that's best sometimes can be selfish, and that still makes it flesh. Only what I do in Christ. I'm amazed at this Christmas season how when people abbreviate Christmas, they X out Jesus and all we're left with is a mess. Because that's what happens with my life. If I X out Jesus, I'm only left with a mess. Why don't they X out the mess and create Christ? I'd rather see Christ X than X Christ, but that's this culture. Get Jesus out of it. Well, that's why we're in such a mess. Because we've taken Jesus out of everything. And if Jesus is out of my life, I'm nothing but a mess. You're saying, well, you're nothing but a mess anyway. But I made me. But with Jesus, I am something. My life and your life amounts to great things for what he can make in us. So we've got to get cleaned up. You say that sounds like an oxymoron. You're cleaning dirt. But dirt has impurities and sticks and pebbles and little bitty rocks. And all that stuff needs to be cleaned up. Why? Because we got a long process to go before you're that vessel. And first you got to let God clean you. Get off those things that you know are not in your life or that are in your life that shouldn't be. Getting cleaned up by the potter. Then there's the softening or treading time. Isaiah 41, 25 said, As the potter treads clay, many times they do it with their feet. Squish, 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 just continually treading it, sometimes with their hands, kneading it. And Why are you doing all that? Because clay sometimes can be hard, non-pliable, stubborn. No amens, I'm going to say it again. Stubborn. Okay, thank you. That means, God, I'm not going to let you do this one thing in my life. And so when he gets down there to start shaping you, we're going to have a problem because he's going to want to take some stuff and squeeze and form. He wants it real soft clay, and you're not soft right now. You're saying you're buckling up, and God's got to break you and me and say, I've got to keep treading. God, stop doing that. Mm -mm. You're, not, you're still hard. And when I get down there, you're not going to be pliable for me to shape you. And that treading doesn't, that's not good in the sense of what we feel good, but it is good to make us more like Jesus so we can soften up. Why are all these things happening? Maybe, I don't know, we don't know what God does different things in any of our life, but maybe it's to get you soft. 
not stubborn, not rebellious, not hard. Some of us get hard to certain things. And when we get soft and pliable, God can do anything in our life. He can say anything in our life and we'll do it. Why? Because we're so soft and moldable. When he takes that thing later on and spins it, he can just barely touch it and his finger will mark, will just make an indention into that vessel. So he's got to get that. Are you being treaded? Say, Brother Jim, I think I'm being treaded. Well, that's not a bad thing. Let him keep treading till you... Now, now remember, maybe it'll stop when you just get soft enough, pliable enough, easy to use, like clay needs to be eventually. And, and I read one book said that some potters would use a thin wire to poke it because sometimes it gets air bubbles. Sometimes we can get some air bubbles. Sometimes some hot air bubbles. You know, say, well, I'm just who I am and this is what I say and, and that little prod and just keeps going because you don't want any air bubbles in there because when it gets to the firing stage, you're going to, that bubble will pop. You get a big old crack and hole in your vessel. You don't want that. So he just takes that wire and keeps going through. Why? To make sure there's no air bubbles in there. Treading, poking, prodding. Oh, all to make us soft. I think I'll tell the Lord, Lord, let me get soft. <laughs> That's enough prodding. That's enough po Let me just be soft and pliable. I'm not going to be stubborn anymore. Just, I want to be able to say, Lord, whatever you want to do in my life, you can do. Are you there? Lord, whatever you want to do, you can do it. Monetary, occupationally, relationally, physically, spiritually, servant. Here you go. Whatever. I said, Dad's pliable. Okay, now. See, so why do you need to be treaded anymore after that? You see, because you're ready for the shaping. Which comes next. Shaping time. Job said, I have been formed out of the clay. Whoever I am, which Job was a blameless, outstanding man, he knew that he had been formed by the potter. Now, you know when the potter has the wheel, he, he has a stone wheel here back then, and he had a wheel down at the bottom, they were connected it, and he'd take his foot and he'd spin it. And he'd put that clay on there so that clay was spinning so that he could shape it on that wheel. Now, the clay's us. But unlike us, clay's not alive. And once he puts that clay on the center of the wheel, it stays there. Some Christians like to wiggle off. I'm going to say it again. Some Christians like to wiggle off. Okay, here's what I'm... I don't like that. Here's what I need to make you. And they wiggle off that table. I call them Christian wigglers. We got some Christian wigglers that God's been trying to do something off and you just keep going off that wheel. He gets his hand there and starts pushing and shaping and making you know what, and then you get off that wheel. You've got to stay in the wheel and let him squeeze where he needs to squeeze, which may be some constrictions. And when he lets off and that vessel gets bigger, that may be the freedoms that we have to... We all have freedoms in Christ, but he begins to shape however his hands choose to shape to make us what he wants. You say, Brother Tim, you mean I need to be in the center of his will? Absolutely. Or Brother Tim, are you saying center of his will, W-H-E-E-L? Or are you saying be in the center of his will, W-I-L-L? -L? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Because that's, I believe, is the same thing. If you're in the center of his W-I-L-L, -L, you're in the center of his W-H-E-E-L -E for him to shape you and mold you because that's where you need to be. That's where the center of his will is, in the center of his will. Not in the sides, not on the edge, not wiggling off, but staying right there, moldable, pliable, and right in the middle for him to make us into what he wants us to be. See, giving up some of those things isn't easy. Lord, I've been this way all my life. I've had these things all my life. I like these things. Some of these things take sacrifice. 
but they're never without a blessing. Whatever you're letting him take out, knead out, clean out, it's always going to be for your good because guess what? Eventually, we're not there yet, but we're going to put you in a kiln. If you're a clay vessel, you've got to end up in the kiln, the oven, because that's how a vessel gets finally prepared is in the oven. And if you don't let him do those things now, and you've got air bubbles, you've got water, you've got debris, it's going to end up in bad shape when you go through a trial down the road in this kiln. Now, the next part is the drying time. Because now you've been cleaned, you've been treaded, you've been made soft, you've been shaped, you've been formed, you've been made into a vessel, and now you have to dry because you still got a lot of water in you. And that water's got to dry out. Some people feel like, Brother Tim, I feel like maybe I may be in some drying time. Some people call it the shelf time. That doesn't mean you don't be used by God, but it feels like there's a time that you just kind of on the shelf drying. Moses experienced that. Remember after he killed the Egyptian? He spent all those years caring for sheep. He was kind of in a drying time until God called him back to rescue the children of Israel. He was used. He was learning shepherding, and, but he, he was in a dry time. Abraham probably thought he was in a dry time. He's supposed to be the father of any nation. Didn't even have any children. God blessed him later in life with children. Sometimes we do feel like we're in a, a dry phase. Well, sometimes that just happens. That we go through these things. But we have to. Because the drying process is just as important as the other one. So don't be alarmed if you feel like you're going through a dry phase. Not dry spiritually, but just dry, Lord, I, I just feel like I'm drying out. Well, you're getting ready maybe for the kiln, which is next. None of us like all those other things that happen in our life, but they can be a blessing. In 1986, two men in Israel who lived in Israel were in their boat in the Sea of Galilee, and they looked down and they saw something down in the water, and they pulled it out, and it was a, uh, a boat that dated back to the years of Jesus. Could have been the very boat Jesus was in because the dating would have been exactly that time period. Now it's on display. How was it found? It was found during a three-year drought. They'd have never found that boat had the water level not been so low they discovered such a jewel. See, that doesn't mean the drying time's going to be absolutely completely bad. It may be that time you discover some things you had never discovered about yourself that need to be changed because now these guys have a blessing for the whole world to see, only made possible by a three-year drought. The third thing is God still, I hate to say this, he tests us. See, when he made this vessel he was making, uh, he discovered it was spoiled in his hand. He was, I don't know what spoiled was. He found some stick, he found some clay. I don't know what it was, but when he was getting ready to do all that, he seemed like he had some sort of test in his mind anyway, that this piece of clay right now is not ready for shaping. I need to start over on it. It's not ready for that. And I guess he just squished it all back to the glob because it went through some sort of, it's in his hand, some sort of test. It, and when the, he didn't, it didn't pass the test. Why? Because it was uh, spoiled. That's a unique word to use, and it? Spoiled. It wasn't ready. It wasn't ready for the fire. So he had to start over on this process. Because see, sometime, if it's not done then, and it's just looked over, the fault will show up after the heating time. It always does. See, what would happen is some potters would rush things and when it got in the kiln, it would have a crack or a spot or a hole or a chip because some of these processes weren't done long enough or well enough. And there was some imperfection in it, and so that imperfection showed up. Now, what should you have done? Well, you should start over. But a lot of those potters were dishonest, and they said, we're not going to start over. They would take wax, 
and they'd fill up that hole, fill up that crack, and then paint it. You never knew anything. That's a pretty vessel. Oh, that's a pretty Christian vessel. And then they'd put it in the shops, and most of those shops were dark because they obviously didn't have much light back then, except by candle. And so you'd go in and you'd shop and say, that's a pretty vessel right there. I think I'll buy it. What you would do if you're a smart buyer, you'd do this. You said, sir, can I take this outside? Because I'm not going to buy it unless I can take it outside. Okay. And then what you'd do, you'd take it outside. And let me show you this verse before I go any further. In Philippians 1, 9, Paul was speaking about believers' love abounding. And then we was talking later on about this abounding love. He, he says, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, <clears throat> be sincere and blameless till the day of Christ. Now, this word blameless is hell krenis, hell krenis. The hell means sun rays. Krenis means to judge or prove or test. So it could mean, the way you could translate the word sincere is tested by sunlight. Our English word for sincere comes from two Latin words, sin, sun, sera, testing, sun testing is even our Greek word. Are you sincere? Do you really mean business? Are you sincere about this relationship? Are you sincere about this thing? Yes, I'm sun tested is what you're telling somebody in its true sense. Back in the Hebrew, the same thing. I need to see if this vessel is sincere so I have to take it out and sun test it. All you had to do is do like this and you know what would show up? That wax. You cheater. You put wax on these cracks. When I use this thing after a while, it's going to melt, and then I'm going to have a cracked pot. Maybe that's where that came from. I don't know. But anyway, you know, they're going to they're look at that vessel, and they said, this thing's got wax in it. And I, I couldn't spot it in your dark store. But when I put it out in the sun, it shows you just band-aided it. So that's what a lot of Christians do. I've got this fault, and I'll just band-aid it. You know, you don't go to your doctor and say, you got cancer, and said, well, gosh, I'll have to get a bigger Band-Aid. You don't Band-Aid that. You get surgery for that or some sort of treatment, not a bigger Band-Aid. But God shows us something in our life that needs to be changed, and we just Band-Aid it. We put a little wax on it. Well, that shows up later. God wants us sun-tested. When we get to the light of His Word and it exposes, that's why we read the Word. It's like a mirror and we see us. Because if I don't have the Word and I don't have preaching and I'm away from God's people, you know what my flesh always tells me? Tim Strickland, you're doing pretty good. You're in good shape. But boy, when I listen to sermons and I read His Word, I'm saying, oh man, do I have a lot to work on. Sun-tested. See, we've got to keep doing that. But a lot of people say, I want to stay away from that kind of preaching or that kind of deal because I don't want to see. Do you tell your doctor that? You got those x-rays, but don't show me what they show. And don't look at them. You may see something negative. No, you want to be as healthy as you can physically. So you tell that doctor, you look at that x-ray through and through and show me it because I want to be healthy spiritually. Same way should be uh, physically. Same way should be spiritually. I should say, God, test me. Get me out in the sunlight. Show me your word, because why? I don't want to crack during this kiln process, which is coming around the corner. And I want to be tested by you. Number four, God still, praise the Lord, uses us. What was he making? Was he making a picture to hang on a wall? Was he making something to display in a... Uh, a village outside to be looked upon. He was making a vessel. And a vessel is something that's made to be used. God wants to make us into a vessel, not for looks, but for use. A lot of Christians get saved, cleaned up, kneaded, made pliable, formed into a vessel, and then dye that vessel and never use that vessel for what God made you. A vessel for. See, here he is making something to be used. You know, when you get hired at your job, it's not just to be there to be looked at. What are you doing here? I just showed up so everybody will see me. Oh, really? 
Mm -hmm. That's why I was hired here to be seen. <laughs> some of you say, oh, we know some employees like that. But that's not what it's supposed to be. What? He hired or she hired you to be used by that company for whatever you were hired to be used for. Now, when you were saved and cleaned up and shaped up, you were made into a vessel to be looked at. No, to be used. That's why you and I are vessels. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.21, if a man cleanses himself from these things, you can read back all the things you clean, cleaned yourself from, he will be a vessel for honor. You'll be a vessel for honor, sanctified, and to just be looked at. No, useful to the master, prepared to be looked at. No, for every good work. See, that's where a lot of people miss out on their walk. You've been made a vessel. Now be used as a vessel for His glory. That's why He's made us. This is a, a reason for all of this happening in our life. Not just to make us more like Jesus, which it is, and to make us more pliable so He can speak to us, and it is, but also to be used by Him for every good work. You know, one thing we're all guilty of, many of us, is we like to compare our life with others. Well, they look how much they're getting blessed. Well, I'm not. Uh, look at their health. It's going better, and mine's getting worse. And look, they went through that illness, and they got healed, and mine's not. And look at, the, you know, and you look at what people have or their health or situation. Look, God's not doing that in their life, and look what he's doing in mine that's negative. And, you know, we just do all this comparison. But we've got to stop and say, you know what? God's not making it, all of us into the exact same vessel. You know, if you asked me to over to lunch today and, and I came over to your house and I'd say, you know, um, you're having soup and salad and, you know, a beverage and whatever, and of course you hopefully you have dessert in a dessert bowl, you know. And I say, you know, all you got on this plate is, is plates. There's no forks, there's no cups, there's no dessert cups and all that other stuff, which should be your biggest bowl. And, but, oh, we only have plates, Brother Tim. We don't have any of that other stuff. We only bought plates. Only plates? I mean, that doesn't serve the purpose. You should have a variety of vessels to use. See, God has a variety of vessels. He's making bowls for bowl stuff in the church. He's making cups for cup stuff in the church. He's making plate for plate stuff in the church. And we're all looking around wondering why God's not doing exactly the same thing in all of us. God's making us into what He's making us. We're all different vessels. And we can't compare what God may be doing or not doing or blessing or not blessing. He's all doing a unique work. He, he loves us all the same, but He's making us into different vessels all the same. Well, I don't like it. Well, sometimes none of us like it, but we may be what Isaiah said in Isaiah 45. Whoa! That's not a horse call right there. That's you in bad shape, whoa. That's a bad shape, whoa, not a horse, whoa. Whoa to the one who does what? You ever quarrel with your maker? Lord, I'm not, I don't like this rule. I don't like this word. I don't like this. Well, woe to you to quarrel and me to quarrel with my, my maker. Why? Because I'm a what? I'm an earthen vessel among the vessels of earth will the clay, that's me, say to the potter, that's God, what are you doing? He has a right to do what he wants to do to make me into the vessel he wants me to be and I may be bucking the system. Mm -mm. You ain't going to make me into that and I'm not going to go there I wonder why we're having some difficulties because I'm quarreling with my maker. He said, no, I need to push in here because I need to make you into... Make, uh, I'm not meaning God has to. I mean, God's God. I mean, you see the illustration. It's not like God's got a force. But you know what I'm saying? He's trying to make me into what... And I'm resisting. 
And I'm saying to my maker, what are you doing? You can't do this in me. And we quarrel with him. But we can. He always can. He's God. We just got to submit and let him use us and make us and form us into what he wants us to be. But he still uses us. And if you're a vessel, you need to be used. The great violinist Niccolo Paganini, born in the late 1700s, was probably at that time the greatest violinist and composer the world knew from Italy. And as the great violinist from Italy, known throughout the world as the great violinist, he put in his will that his violin that he used all over the world for concerts would go to his home city in Italy with one stipulation. No one could ever use it. It could only be for display. Now, it was amazing that he used that violin so many years and it looked almost brand new. So much use, you'd think it looked wore out, but it looked almost brand new even though it was used all the time. But the city did display it in its case. And in a short time, it became was worm eaten dilapidated because the violin was made by a violin maker with the wood and the strings and the deal all to be out of the case and to be used as a violin the maker never intended it to be in a case on display all the time and so that particular violin just decayed well what a lesson to all of us God made us a vessel not to be looked in and looked on because if we do, no wonder our lives feel decayed, meaningless, going through the routine. God wants to use these vessels. And they were designed with the manufacturer intending it to be used. Not look at it. wonder why we have the problem sometimes we have with feeling kind of decayed. Oh, praise the Lord for the last one. God still remains. But the vessel that was he was making on the clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he threw it away. Oh, thank you that that's not. And we'd all be on the scrap heap because we've all messed up in our walk, in our life. God says, oh, no, no, no. Remake. I would say he's the God of second chances, but I'd have to say third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and seventh for me. I don't know about you. We got four of us that had more than two. So God, praise God, didn't say, You're never, ever going to be used again in my work. You've messed up too many times. You're going to the heat pile, and you're never going to be used again. Oh, praise God, we've got a God of grace that says, Oh, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to squish you back again. I'm going to have to knead you and squeeze you and clean you and whatever, but I'm going to remake you. <laughs> what now, Lord? And to another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. I'm going to remake you. Oh, thank the Lord for a remaking God. It doesn't give up on us and continues to be faithful and patient with us and remakes us. Oh, so many in here were remade vessels. We got a testimony and said, that's where I was, but here's where I am. I got a long way to go, but God remade me. He's a remaker. We should say, thank you, Lord, for being a remaker. That you have taken now time to reshape, reform, reclean, redrive it. Because you're a faithful God who remakes. In our verses were one through four, but read the whole passage, I came across 10. This is in the Amplified. And again, this whole story was written in context of to a nation, Judah. We're applying it to individuals because you can take the word that's given to a nation and apply it to individuals because there's individuals in a nation. And here's where it's said in the Amplified. And if they, that's the nation of Judah, do evil in my sight, obey not my voice. They're not going to do what I say in my word. But I've told you, 
then I will regret, like it says in the, in the Amplified, and reverse my decision concerning the good with which I said I would benefit. I told him a good I was going to bring. I call that a blessing. So it's kind of like God put the blessing gear shift into forward. So here come a blessing. And he said, now I'm going to put in the clutch and put that bad boy in reverse. Let's back up that blessing. Because they're not going to get the good I had intended to give them. Well, I read that verse and said, I wonder how many blessings were almost to me. And I said no to something and stuck with my stubbornness. And God just put my little blessing in reverse and I never saw it. God, why aren't you blessing me? Where a lot of people go. Well, it was on your way. He just put it in reverse. And you and I never got it. Because we stayed, and that's in the same passage. That four is what we're reading. The ten is when it happened. God said, if they're going to persist in doing what's wrong and doing what's evil and doing not what I... And you know what evil is. It's not some gross immorality, which it could be that. It's simply not... It's stubbornly not doing what God wants you to do. And that's the general definition of evil. Just stubbornly not doing what God wants you to do. Whether it comes out in different kind of sins, it, it does, but it just does not do it. And he said, I'll regret and reverse what good I had intended. We don't want to be in that mode. I want my blessing to keep on going forward and coming to me what God intended. God said, the decision concerning the good which I said I would benefit them. Because God can bring some benefits. Amen. God's a benefit bringer. But he can also be a benefit re reverser. Because he's telling them, I want to bless you with what I want to send you as a blessing. We're clay. We're already in that process. Praise God, he remakes us. So whatever we've done, we can't say in this congregation, you know what? I've already not done something right or I coulda, woulda, shoulda. It's always time to be able to reverse course. Say, Lord, we know. I'm just clean. You're the potter. And Lord, I'm soft and moldable. And this morning I'm willing to say, Lord, whatever. Well, that's a big word. Don't hold stuff back. Whatever unless this. Whatever but not that. Whatever but not that one. Uh, everything but that. As long as your words don't say the word but this, and you're ready, you're pliable. Say, Lord, I want to watch you remake. Remake my life. Remake my work. Remake, remake my ministry. Remake my marriage. We make my relationship with family. We make my relationship with children. We make my relationship with people I've had alt against. Just do some remake. I'm here to just be remade. And I don't care where we are in our spiritual life, just a new remake. Just, I just want to be pliable. And if you want to make an adjustment to me, it just takes a little experience. Because I'm not saying. With every head bowed and every eye closed as you stand to your feet.